Hi, this is Melinda Eshelman. I'm a cardiac anesthesiologist at the University of Kentucky, and this YouTube video focuses on cardiovascular keywords for the ITE. First and foremost, I have to give credit to Dr. Shell for starting this list of keywords that he has updated for many, many years. Um, and so I updated it in this last year. The current list of keywords that we are going to at least present to you contains keywords from 2009 to present. I'm not going to review all of these keywords. This keyword review is going to focus on keywords that showed up in the last ITE, so in the ITE from 2021, and also keywords that were frequently missed by our residents at the University of Kentucky. So what's going to follow in the next few slides is a list of all of the cardiac keywords that have shown up on the IT exam. I will not be covering all of them in these lectures. Dr. Shell has videos that he's put out um, a few, I think two or three years ago that go through all of these. I'm just, or most all of these, I'm mostly going to focus on, again, the ones that showed up on the 2021 and training exam. I split the keywords down into five subsets, and these subsets include the pre-op evaluation, um, cardiac physiology, heart disease, anesthesia for cardiac surgery, and then congenital heart disease. The keywords that have to do with the pre-op evaluation are the actual pre-op cardiac exam, the significance of heart murmurs, perioperative beta blockade and the risk of perioperative beta blockade, perioperative antihypertensive medications, and indications for pre-op EKG. Um, the ACC AHA guidelines when it comes to stents and stents and surgical delay, the RCRI major adverse cardiac event risk calculator, um, prophylaxis indications for endocarditis and Brugada syndrome and the diagnosis of Brugada syndrome. The cardiac keywords that have to do with cardiac physiology include keywords related to the cardiac cycle, the ion flux that occurs throughout the cardiac cycle, pressure throughout the cardiac cycle, EKG and the cardiac cycle, um, electrolyte abnormalities and how they appear on EKG, the calculation of cardiac output based on both the FIC principle and thermodilution, calculation of SVR and PVR, mixed venous oxygenation, um, cardiac innervation, cardiovascular reflexes, including the carotid sinus and the effects of um, heart transplantation on these various cardiovascular reflexes in the bain bridge reflex. And those wonderful ventricular function curves, which I actually really like, um, diastolic dysfunction and how they appear on these ventricular function curves, CHF and how it looks on these curves, the effects of various drugs on the shape of these curves, including milrinone and phenylephrine, systolic versus diastolic heart failure, lucitropy, and diastology what happens with LV dilation and how that affects wall stress, um, the causes of beta-1 upregulation, the effects of, of beta blockers on myocardial ischemia, cardiac function, the parasympathetic effects on cardiac functions, and factors that cause the release of ANP. The cardiac keywords that have to do with heart disease include myocardial ischemia, coronary blood flow, and coronary blood supply, including to the AV node, wall motion abnormalities in coronary blood flow, and heart block that can possibly occur due to um, blocked coronary blood supply, um, aortic stenosis, aortic stenosis and arrhythmias, aortic insufficiency management slash medical treatment of AI, acute MR versus chronic MR, carcinoid syndrome and the cardiac lesions that you see with carcinoid syndrome, cardiac tamponade and the effects on heart rate and cardiac output, um, and how you differentiate between cardiac tamponade and pericardial effusion, the pathophysiology of a PE, RV failures, RV failure, arrhythmias, digoxin toxicity, torsade to point, ventricular tachycardias, SVT, and Wolf Parkinson White, so abnormalities that you can see on EKG and different arrhythmias, AFib and the stroke risk of determination, management of complete heart block, AICD um, placement indications, the treatment for symptomatic bradycardia, indications for biventricular pacemaker, intraop complications of a pacemaker placement, and pulmonary hypertension. Keywords that have to do with anesthesia for cardiac surgery include um, keywords related to heart transplant. Talked about it a little bit already, but the denervated heart, the exercise physiology of the denervated heart, bradycardia and heart transplant, the treatment, um, organ transplant, cold ischemia times, and fluid management of organ donors, um, cardiopulmonary bypass, separation from cardiopulmonary bypass, management of low SVR post cardiopulmonary bypass, the oxygenator and gas embolism that can occur while you're on cardiopulmonary bypass, the prime of the bypass circuit additives, and then the different temperature monitoring 
monitoring sites that we use throughout bypass. Um, a minimally invasive cabbage and the single lung ventilation that um, is required for that. Indications for retrograde cardioplegia, complications of a TAVR, contraindications of an intraortic balloon pump. Um, and then TEE is something that's coming up more and more. So basic TEA views, TEA views, and cannula placement, aortic valve and left ventricular anatomy and left atrial appendage anatomy and these views on TEE. Um, cardiomyopathy on TEE, the diagnosis and the treatment. Um, HIT, heparin resistance, antithrombin 3 deficiency, protamine reaction prevention, um, and then sort of not necessarily cardiac but related to, to cardiovascular uh, physiology, um, bilateral carotid endodirectomies and the physiology, complications of carotid endodirectomy, and ischemia monitoring during and after carotid endodirectomies and transcranial Doppler. Not too many keywords that have to do with congenital heart disease, but it does show up sometimes specifically tetralogy of Fallot um, and the lesions associated with tetralogy of Fallot. Fontan, single ventricle physiology and circulation and ventilation in patients with a Fontan, hypoplastic left heart syndrome, and PGE1 use. Okay, that was a lot of keywords that I just threw at you. I'm not going to go into depth um, in a, with a few of the keywords that have shown up more recently on the ITE and the ones that seem to be frequently risked missed both by our residents and residents across the country. So the first keyword I want to discuss is the revised cardiac risk index or the RCRI. This is a list of six independent predictors of major cardiac complications. Um, I think they make sense logically, but they've also been shown in studies to increase the risk of cardiac complications postoperatively. The first independent predictor is high risk surgery. So the type of surgery itself, the major vascular surgery, open intraperitoneal surgery, intrathoracic procedures, all of these are examples of high-risk procedures that get you one point on the RCRI. The second independent predictor is a history of ischemic heart disease. This is not limited to just an MI. So if you've had an MI, yes, you do get one point for this, but it also includes a positive exercise stress test, or if the patient currently has chest pain that you believe to be due to myocardial ischemia, if they regularly use nitrates, if an EKG has pathologic Q waves, all of these are examples of ischemic heart disease, and all of these would give you one point on the RCRI. If a patient had coronary disease and then was revascularized completely, you do not get a point with this because they, they no longer have coronary disease because of the revascularization. A history of heart failure gets you one point. A history of cerebrovascular disease, whether this is a stroke or a TIA, some sort of cerebrovascular disease, gets you one point. Diabetes, specifically requiring insulin. So if you're not on insulin therapy, you do not get a point for this. But if your diabetes requires insulin, then you do get one point for this. And the serum creatinine greater than two. So again, to go through this, the six predictors that increase the risk of major cardiac complication are high-risk surgery, history of ischemic heart disease, which is not just limited to an MI, history of heart failure, history of cerebrovascular disease, diabetes requiring insulin, and a pre-op serum creatinine greater than two. AFib and obesity. I just wanted to talk about these for a second. So actually, AFib, a retrospective study, did show an association between a, a history of prior admission for AFib and post-op complications, and the risk of post-op complications was actually higher than in patients that had coronary artery disease. However, this study did not, AFib did not make it onto the RCRI, but just something to think about that your patient might be higher risk if they have AFib, even though they don't get a point on this particular scoring system. Obesity, in our notes, we regularly write, write obesity complicating all aspects of care. It certainly does complicate all aspects of hair, Care, however, it hasn't been shown specifically to be an independent predictor of end organ damage, unlike these other six factors, which have been shown to be independent predictors of major cardiac complications. So why do we care and what do we mean when we say major cardiac complications? Um, so this is using the RCRI scoring system. If you, have no, if you have no risk factors, one, two, or three risk factors, the top study was done in 1999. The bottom um, is from a study that was done in 2005. I think the take-home point is if you have no risk factors, you have about half a percent risk. 
of having an adverse cardiac outcome. And if you have three or more risk factors, your risk is somewhere between five and 9%. And so that's not an insignificant number. That's one in 20 patients, somewhere between one in 20 and and, and one in 10 patients. Um, And so I just think it's important to keep in mind that yes, we understand these risk factors, but the importance and the reason why we're looking at risk factors is because these are some really bad complications that can happen afterwards, cardiac death, non-fatal MI, cardiac arrest, um, pulmonary edema, VFib, like these are all really bad things. And so the, when you think about the RCRI, um, I mean, a, a lot of my patients I know have diabetes requiring insulin, have had a TIA and are having high risk surgery. So right there, that's three or more risk factors. And one in 20 of those patients or more is going to have a complication. So I think just kind of bringing it home and making sure that we look at the reason why we care about all of this. So the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association guidelines when it comes to stents. So five to ten percent, five to ten percent of patients that have a drug eluting stent placed will require surgery within one year. Currently, the recommendation is for patients that have a drug eluting stent placed to be on one year of dual antiplatelet therapy, which is why it's important that five to ten percent of these patients may require surgery during this one year where they're supposed to be on dual antiplatelet therapy. Dual antiplatelet therapy is usually aspirin and clopidogrel. Clopidogrel is a P2Y12 inhibitor. Um, And the complications of discontinuing this dual antiplatelet therapy prematurely are pretty severe. Complications we think about are MI, death, stent thrombosis, or the urgent need to repeat revascularization. So these aren't small complications that we're talking about. Premature cessation of dual antiplatelet therapy is the strongest predictor for stent thrombosis. And if there is a stent thrombosis that develops, the complications of this, again, are pretty severe. So 50 to 75 50 to 70 percent of these patients will develop an MI and 10 to 40 percent of these patients will will actually die because of this this uh, thrombosis, this stent thrombosis. So what do we do with these patients that require surgery within one year of this stent placement? So it all kind of depends on the timing of this surgery, if it can wait at all. Um, So patients who undergo major non-cardiac surgery within six weeks, especially within two weeks, have a a markedly increased risk of adverse cardiovascular events. So if you need surgery, you know, within six weeks of having this drug eluting stent placed or really any stent placed, it significantly increases your risk of adverse cardiovascular events. Um, major non-cardiac surgery is defined as something that rec- that would require or would recommend discontinuation of the dual antiplatelet therapy due to the risk of bleeding. So that is what is considered major non-cardiac surgery. There are, that being said, there are better and worse times to do surgery. The risk of um, adverse cardiovascular events remains elevated until six months after um, a PCI. So if you can wait six months for this major non-cardiac surgery, it is best to wait six months. If you absolutely cannot wait six months, um, you know, wait at least one to three months if possible. And interestingly, um, whether the it was a, a drug eluting stent or a bare metal stent, um, the recommendation was still to wait six months if possible. I know traditionally we thought, you know, bare metal stent um, should be fine within one month, but according to the ACC and AHA, it is better if you can wait up to six months. So if you can keep these patients on dual antiplatelet, if it's a surgery that can wait for six months, it's best to wait six months. There are other things that also increase the risk. Um, You think about, you know, patients, non-elective surgery um, is going to increase risk. So if, if there's some sort of trauma, a fall, a head bleed or something, and there, there's certain surgeries that are, are also, you know, you have to balance instant thrombosis versus, you know, if if there's a, um, a uh, bleed in the brain, um, obviously neurosurgeons are going to want to stop dual antiplatelet therapy. So it is, um, a, you know, a risk benefit and, and a discussion with the surgeon that you can have. But if you can wait at least six months, the answer in the test is if you can wait at least six months, the risk remains elevated until about six months. It's better to wait a year, but really, if you can wait six months, it's best to wait six months before stopping dual antiplatelet therapy. If you can stop just one, um, you know, the I think we think it's better if you're only on aspirin. However, just being on aspirin can still increase your risk of bleeding 20 to 50 percent. So it's it's not benign at all, Um, but uh, better than, you know, instant thrombosis and an MI if if the surgeon's okay with continuing aspirin um, throughout the perioperative period.
All right, transesophageal echocardiography. Hopefully my residents don't react this way when I start talking about the echo, uh, but as a cardiac anesthesiologist, I get excited about the heart, I get excited about echo, and I get excited about echo findings. Um, but this is something that it would behoove you to learn even if you decide not to do a fellowship in cardiac anesthesia. This is something that is showing up on the in-training exam, it's showing up on the advanced exam, and it's showing up on the OSCE. And um, aside from it showing up on the exams, I think it's a great tool to be able to use if you have a patient that decompensates or if you're trying to evaluate a patient. So even if you um, don't find yourself doing a cardiac uh, fellowship, I think it, it is important, uh, an important skill for you to learn. Okay, the first keyword um, related to TEE is left ventricle anatomy. So this, I think the easiest way to start is with the transgastric short axis view. On the left is a pictorial of what you see, and on the right is a live intra-op echo of a transgastric short axis view. I think it's easiest to start here because in this view, you can see all six walls of the ventricle. You can see only one segment of them, um, the mid segment of it. So you can't see, you know, obviously the, the entire wall in this view, but you can identify um, blood supply from each of the coronaries, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, in the heart, the anterior wall is across from the inferior wall. So normally we think of anterior and uh, posterior, superior, and inferior, but in the heart we talk anterior and inferior, and the way um, I remember this is AI, artificial intelligence, anterior, inferior, um, and so the A is across from the I, unlike normally when we talk about anatomy. So you have your anterior wall and your inferior wall. The other four walls of the heart are Again, I think logically named, they're either part of the septum or part of the lat lateral wall. So if it's anterior and part of the septum, it's anterior septal. If it's inferior and part of the septum, it's inferior septal. If it's anterior and lateral, it's anterior lateral. And if it's inferior and lateral, it's inferior lateral. So again, anterior is always going to be across from inferior. So anterior lateral is going to be across from inferior septal. Anterior septal is across from inferior lateral. Okay, and you can see all these walls in this short axis view. So the other view that I think is good to know and is relatively easy to remember the walls in is the midesophageal two-chamber view. And if you think about what we were looking at in the stomach, what we're basically doing is cutting the heart straight through right between the anterior and inferior walls, straight in half. So you're not going to see any of the right ventricle in this midesophageal two-chamber view. It's going to be found at around 90 degrees. And so you're going to see the anterior wall and the inferior wall. Now, an easy way to remember which way is the anterior wall and which way is the inferior wall. So the anterior wall is close to the appendage. So you can see the left atrial appendage on the upper right-hand side of the image. And so that wall on the right-hand side is going to be the anterior wall and the wall on the other side, the left side of the screen is going to be the inferior wall. So now that we can identify the different walls of the heart, we can start talking about coronary artery blood supply to the different walls. Frequently asked is, there's a change in the echo, what graph do you think went down? Or this graph went down, what change can you expect to see in the echo? On the left, this is a really nice pictorial put out by the journal of the, it, it was published in the Journal of the American Society of Echocardiography, and it's a consensus statement. Um, again, it might be a little more detail than you need for the in-training exam. Uh, two of the images that we just talked about are here. You can see the two-chamber and the transgastric short axis view. Um, and uh, the four-chamber and the, the long axis view are there as well. Um, and so that does a nice job color coding the different blood supplies to those walls. Um, the left main, so, so of the two coronary arteries, the left main quickly bifurcates, it's a very short artery, it quickly bifurcates into the left anterior descending artery and the circumflex artery. The left anterior descending, the LAD, often, most often gets the arterial graft, the lima graft, and the blood supply, the LAD supplies the anterior two thirds of the septum, the anterior wall, of the left ventricle and the apex of the left ventricle. The circumflex artery supplies the anterior lateral wall and part of the inferior septal wall. So the anterior lateral wall is supplied both by sometimes the LAD and sometimes the circumflex, but it's usually the left side. The inferior septal wall can be also supplied a little bit by the posterior descending artery, but we'll get to that in a second. The right coronary artery supplies the inferior third of the septum, the right side of the heart, and the inferior wall of the left ventricle, and as well 
most often the AV node. So there is an AV nodal artery that comes off usually the right coronary artery 90% of the time, and that supplies the AV node. That's important to know because if you do lose supply, blood supply to the AV node, you can go into complete heart block. Um, so that, again, that AV nodal artery often comes from the uh, right coronary artery. The blood supply to the various parts of the heart that I just reviewed is what is generally common in a, quote, normal person. There are people that have anomalous coronary circulation, and you have to look at their cath in relation to their record to kind of figure out what's going on. But I think that's beyond the scope of the ITE. What does show up sometimes is left versus right dominance. So left versus right dominance is determined based on where the posterior descending artery arises from. Most of the time, 70% of the time, the PDA arises from the right coronary artery, and so that is what is referred to as right dominance. 20% of the time, there is dual blood supply, and so from the circumference and the right coronary, and that is considered co-dominant, and then 10% of the time, you get blood supply from the left side only, from the circumflex only, and that is considered left side dominant. So it's somewhat anomalous if you have, you know, your PDA arises from the circumflex, but um, there are other anomalies that are, are much less common that can affect your echo findings. So kind of bringing things back home, we've talked about the coronary blood supply and the coronary anatomy, and then identified all of the walls of the ventricle. This was my case that you're seeing in in this echo, uh, and which wall can you identify which looks more hypokinetic than the rest? I would say there's global hypokinesis, but which wall is the worst? The worst wall in my mind would be the inferior wall, which is the wall closest to the top of the screen, which is closest to the TEE probe. Now, bringing it all together, which coronary artery usually supplies this wall of the heart, this inferior wall? I really hope that you said the PDA, which 70% of the time comes from the RCA. So this is an example of how it might, uh, how it's A, useful clinically, and then B, might show up in a test question. I promise I'm almost done talking about TEE. This is the last image that we'll look at, the last view that we'll look at. Um, I do want to say that this, the key, there were quite a few keywords on last year's ITE that were related to TEE, and that is something that, again, is an emerging concept. So I know I spent a fair amount of time on it, but I do think it'll keep showing up more and more. So this view that we're looking at here is the mid-esophageal sword axis view. It's around 30 to 35 degrees, and again, is in the mid-esophagus. Anytime you're in the esophagus, the most posterior thing is usually the left atrium. So for the most part, what you're going to be looking through your viewing window is going to be your left atrium. So that's what's going to show up at the top of the screen, okay? And then to the left of that, you can see is your right atrium. I didn't do the greatest job drawing that. And then on the bottom of the screen is your right ventricle. But what we're looking at really, in addition to the free wall of the right ventricle in this view, are the three cusps of the aortic valve. The three cusps are named after the coronary arteries that should come off of them. So the first cusp we'll talk about is the non-coronary cusp, which, yes, there are no coronary arteries that come off of it. So this is located on the upper left-hand side. It's the upper left-hand cusp, and it is located in between the intraatrial septum. So again, you see the left atrium at the top of the screen, and then you see the septum there, and, and the cusp closest to that is going to be your non-coronary cusp. On the bottom of the screen, again, is the right ventricle, and the, it turns out the right coronary comes from very close to the right ventricle, and so that bottom cusp is going to be your right coronary cusp. And that leaves on the upper right-hand side of the screen is going to be your left coronary cusp. It is closest to the left atrium, and it is where your left main coronary artery comes from. So in the vein of focusing on mostly what was tested in the last year and, and what was most frequently frequently missed. I'm going to talk about aortic insufficiency, but I'm actually not going to talk about aortic stenosis. I would encourage you to read and review aortic stenosis, but I'm just going to focus on aortic insufficiency. There are both chronic and acute causes of aortic insufficiency. Like most lesions, a chronic aortic insufficiency is better tolerated than acute aortic insufficiency. Causes of acute aortic insufficiency include infective endocarditis, um, destroying the valve, and aortic dissection. Sometimes in a dissection, the dissection flap uh, comes down and, and results in an incompetent aortic valve. So that can result in aortic insufficiency. Chronic causes of aortic insufficiency include connective tissue diseases, including Marfan syndrome and Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Sometimes there's dilation of the aortic root, and this 
changes the anatomy and the leaflets cannot come together and they cannot collapse. And so you end up with aortic insufficiency. By cuspid aortic valve, I know traditionally we often think of aortic stenosis, but it can also result in aortic insufficiency. Different inflammatory diseases of the aorta and rheumatic heart disease. So rheumatic heart disease affects the mitral valve, but it can also affect the aortic valve as well. It more frequently affects the mitral valve, um, and it's something that we're seeing less and less of over time, but it can still result in aortic insufficiency. So cardiac lesions are thought of as either pressure overload lesions or volume overload lesions. Aortic insufficiency is a volume overload lesion. There's an increase in stroke volume, there's an increase in end diastolic volume, an increase in end systolic volume, and an increase in left ventricular radius. Um, while both end diastolic and systolic volume increase, the end diastolic volume increases more than the end systolic volume. This long-term volume overload and increase in volumes eventually leads to eccentric hypertrophy. So on the left, you see a picture of concentric hypertrophy where the LV size gets smaller, the wall gets thicker, the LV mass increases, but the diameter um, is the same. Uh, eccentric hypertrophy, you also have an increase in left ventricular mass, but this is because you have uh, a, a larger diameter. So you have the same wall thickness, but a large, like a normal wall thickness, but a larger diameter. And because you have that larger diameter, you have an increase in LV mass. This is seen with volume overload lesions. And so this is what you see in aortic insufficiency. So why is this increased left ventricular radius bad? Why is this eccentric hypertrophy bad? Um, it goes back to the law of Laplace. La the law of Laplace can actually both be applied to um, aortic stenosis and aortic insufficiency. When you're looking at it through the lens of aortic insufficiency, you have a dilated left ventricle. This dilated left ventricle, uh, at the bottom you see the law of Laplace. So the, the wall stress of the left ventricle is equal to is, is directly proportional with both cavity pressure, so the pressure inside the left ventricle, and the radius. So if the cavity pressure increases or the radius increases, you have an increase in left ventricular wall stress. And when you have an increase in left ventricular wall stress, this increases your myocardial oxygen demand. So both in aortic stenosis, where you have an increase in cavity pressure, and in aortic insufficiency, where you have an increase in left ventricular radius, you end up with an elevated left ventricular wall stress. As far as the hemodynamic management of a, a patient with aortic insufficiency, your heart rate goal is high normal, so 80 to 100, not tachycardia, not tachycardic, but definitely not. A uh, heart rate slower than 60 is not good. The slower your heart rate is, the more time that is spent in diastole, and this allows for more time to uh, for regurgitation. So a slower heart rate is definitely not good. You also want to reduce afterload because if your afterload is too high, this is going to encourage reversal flow of flow and encourage insufficiency. So if your afterload is a little bit low, this is going to encourage forward flow. You also need to maintain preload. It is a balance, though, because this is a volume overloaded state. And so if you give the patient too much preload, too much volume, um, excessive left ventricular preload can lead to pulmonary edema and the pressure will stall back up. So an ideal presser for a patient with aortic insufficiency is going to maintain or augment the contractility, left ventricular contractility, in order to, again, encourage forward flow. You don't want something that's going to purely result in arterial vasoconstriction because, again, this discourages forward flow and encourages backward flow. And so an increased afterload is just going to increase regurgitation. So phenylephrine is not great. You can use it in small bits, but it's not great because not only is it pure arterial vasoconstriction, it also causes reflux bradycardia. And again, bradycardia isn't great for aortic insufficiency. So ephedrine is a really great choice. You have some alpha activity, some beta activity, and so you maintain your contractility, have a little bit of an increase in SVR, and um, are able to increase your coronary perfusion. So a note about the coronary perfusion in a patient with aortic insufficiency, because their diet systolic pressure is so low because of all the insufficiency, they may have normal coronary circulation with no blockage, but they may suffer from poor coronary perfusion just because their diastolic pressure is so low. And remember, these are patients where their diastolic pressure becomes low and their left ventricular end diastolic volume and pressure is elevated. So they have extra volume within their LV and they have decreased delivery because of the low diastolic pressure. So they're their oxygen delivery, their transmural pressure between um, 
means and uh, intraventricular pressure is low. And so you can actually have like symptoms of coronary ischemia in a patient with aortic regurgitation and completely normal coronaries. Intraaortic balloon pump. In my mind, this is connected to aortic insufficiency because when I have a patient with aortic insufficiency, uh, I think of some of the things that may or may not be possible if I run into trouble. For example, delivering anterograde cardioplegia is going to be difficult in this patient because of the insufficiency. The cardioplegia will leak through that incompetent valve. Um, they're probably going to be volume overloaded. And it is a contraindication for an intraaortic balloon pump. So that's why, in my mind, aortic insufficiency and intraaortic balloon pump are keywords that are, that are related. Um, so intraaortic balloon pumps are used in patients with pretty bad coronary disease. Uh, they have a couple different ways that they function. So they are used to decrease the myocardial oxygen, oxygen demand while also increasing the myocardial oxygen supply. So this balloon pump is placed through the femoral vessels and it is placed distal to the arch to the aortic arch and to the vessels to the head and it inflates during diastole and so inflation during diastole in, increases perfusion it improves your diastolic pressure and so it augments coronary perfusion during diastole it then deflates during systole and this allows for forward flow but in addition to allowing for forward flow it also decreases afterload which decreases cardiac work and thus decreasing myocardial oxygen requirements. So by inflating during diastole, it increases coronary perfusion, so increases myocardial oxygen supply. And by deflating during systole, it decreases the afterload, thus decreasing the myocardial oxygen requirements. So contraindications to intraaortic balloon pump placement, as we talked about moderate to severe aortic insufficiency, uh, it will, by inflating during diastole, it will just encourage more regurgitation, and so it will just it, it make the problem worse. It will not augment coronary blood flow. Instead, more of that blood will end up inside the ventricle. So uh, moderate to severe aortic insufficiency is a contraindication to intraaortic balloon pump placement. Other contraindications include aortic dissection. As you can imagine, uh, the balloon may make the flap worse, and it, it might, might also result in pulsations in the false lumen, it could expand the dissection. It is uh, a contraindication to intraaortic balloon pump. Aortic aneurysm, uh, it's, the, the risk is too high. There's a, a risk of embolic complications. Uh, it's difficult just because the size of the aorta, so it's contraindication. Severe sepsis, you don't want to place a device in the body in a patient that's septic, or coagulopathy. So if this patient is already bleeding and already coagulopathic, patients that have balloon pumps do need to be anticoagulated. So if you're already coagulopathic, it is a contraindication to a balloon pump placement. Plus you're cannulating fairly large vessels. Uh, patient refusal, they don't want it. We can't force them to do it. Inability to place device. So if the arteries are very tortuous and and it's difficult. Uh, you know, there's there's risk of damage to the artery, risk of dissection, sometimes a risk of placement due to uh, arterial tortuosity is just not not worth it. So uh, again, uh, aortic insufficiency, aortic dissection, aortic aneurysm, sepsis, coagulopathy, patient refusal, or inability to place are the contraindications to intraaortic balloon pump placement. These are a few of my references. I get a lot of help and input from these two guys here. Uh, this is Miller and Mac. Miller's in the foreground, clearly editing a slide that I'm preparing. Mac is in the background overseeing the entire process. I am not cool enough to have named them after the rapper Mac Miller, um, but I am an anesthesiologist, uh, and so I did name, name them after the Mac blade and the Miller blade. So uh, thank you so much for listening. I hope everyone has a fantastic day.